Hello everybody, Stu Smith here again with a, another tactical fitness report. This one is another one by myself. I am taking questions from a variety of people today that have already sent them in. Um, some of these are part school project and some of these are follow on questions that are typically asked. So a lot of common questions about the Navy SEAL community and process. Uh, let's see, let's get right into it. So the first question is, what training does a career in the Navy SEALs require? Well, you need to do some research and go to sealswick.com, swcc.com, and figure that out. Because there's a lot of training. There's some pre-training that's involved. Once you go to a recruiter, you have to pass the PST which is a 500 yard swim, push up, sit up, pull ups, mile and a half run, and you have to do it with fairly competitive scores. I personally recommend people to be swimming under nine minutes, closer to eight, um, doing 80 to 100 push ups and sit ups, 20 pull ups, and a nine minute run. Those are my recommendations. You'll see those are pretty close to the competitive scores that the Navy wants its candidates to do. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a tough test, and you can't just go in there and take it for your first time ever with your SEAL mentor after you've done delayed entry program. I can't tell you how many people go into that test and can't even swim 500 yards because they've never even tried it before, but they're going to take it anyway, like they're going to pass it. So that is not the way to do it. You need to take some time and prepare yourself to get to the training by acing that test, which may take several months itself. And then you need to take some time getting through the training, which means you're going to prepare yourself for the type of training you're going to endure for six months at Navy SEAL training, also called basic underwater demolition slash SEAL training. And that is in Coronado, California. Um, once again, this is very basic information. Uh, they get a little more involved um, as we go along. But there's about 10 questions here. All right. So there's a lot of training. You know, and like I said, you got to get to the training in order to get through the training. Most people get to the training, but only about 20% make it actually through the training. Um, majority of those people quit in the first four weeks when there is uh, a lot of water testing, water comfort testing, such as drown proofing, underwater knot tying, underwater swims. Uh, that gets a section of people. Uh, there's a lot of people who can't meet the standards in the obstacle course, as well as the four mile timed runs and the two mile ocean swims that you do every week. And there's a group of people that just get cold and quit. Um, there's a group of people who um, get crushed by logs and boats. But I tell people all the time, if you can build a good foundation of strength, have some durability, and just endure four weeks of log PT and boats after Hell Week, which is a kick in the nuts, period. There's not a whole lot you can do to prepare for that. Just gut through that one. Um, after Hell Week, you won't touch another log in a boat. The rest of your training at BUDS will be another 22 weeks of uh, 21 weeks worth of dive training, shooting, navigation, um, weapons training, explosives training, really fun stuff. Still hard, don't get me wrong, you still have your four-mile timed run and your two-mile ocean swim every week and your obstacle course every week and your grinder PTs. You know, all of those still occur and you got to crush those. So what training does a career in the Navy SEALs require? It requires to get through that. Once you get through that, then you're an SQT still a challenging six month course and before you actually become a Navy SEAL uh, and earn your Trident. Uh, SQT is now in Coronado, California. Back in the day, it used to be called STT, where SEAL tactical training, where you had a group on the East Coast and a group on the West Coast. For six months, you would go through that training. 
and then you get your seal trident at the uh, at your command that you were stationed immediately after buds. So that is how it goes now. You get your trident, then you go to your seal team. Uh, then you're a new guy and your training starts really all over again because you're now trying to learn how to implement all of the skills that you've learned in the last year into a platoon and working up cycle before you deploy and actually do that stuff for real. So it's a good two years before, you know, you really become a member of an operational unit. And so your preparation is everything for you to endure that two year challenge. So, or at least a year challenge. So you also have to go through boot camp. That's, you know, of course. <sighs> okay, what's next? Uh, what particular specialization of SEALs were you in? Uh, what additional special training did it require? I actually did SDV, so SEAL delivery vehicle. So you did all your Navy SEAL stuff that you practice in, you know, at BUDS and STT, SQT. Um, and then you do some advanced operator training once you get to your team. Um, and then you actually focus on the skills of learning how to drive those mini subs, how to swim off those mini subs, how to do missions off of big submarines, whether that was with a submarine, a mini sub submarine, or it was locking out boats underwater and floating them up to the surface doing, um, you know, taking people to shore, taking yourself to shore, you know, whatever those that mission requirement was a majority of your seal insertion methods were just from the water. So that's kind of the specialization of what SDVs do. They're all seals, but they can also drive mini subs and they also get launched from big subs very often when needed. However, you know, if there's a, a serious conflict going on where you know, traditional uh, conventional troops are there, special ops are there, um, all SEAL teams will go to that area for their deployments, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq for the last 20 years. That's how, that's how they deploy. So obviously there's no submarine in Afghanistan. So SDV units were actually on land as well. So <clears throat> that was a lot of extra training. I would say it took another six months before you really were comfortable driving that mini sub. And it was a cool mission. It was, it was a tough mission. You were definitely cold. I was probably colder in SDVs than I'd ever was at buds. And I was pretty cold at buds too. Um, what natural abilities or interests are needed for a career in seals? Um, be a part of a team. Definitely need to be a team player. Need to be, fairly tough, uh, physically fit. Um, interests include everything from scuba diving, jumping out of airplanes, shooting guns, you know, even martial arts, you know, some guys really like that, but it's, it, it's a wide variety of interests. You know, we're all different people that come in to form a team and everybody, you know, it really is a team of diversity because you have a lot of skill sets in, all types of areas from mechanics to language experts to, you know, just, you know, operational expertise as well that you've gotten from your years of being on that team. Um, you have to rely on your veterans that have been there, done that. Um, so being able to learn from them, uh, be a good team player, uh, have an open mind. Typically that means being in receive mode more than transmit mode, right? Just got to listen and learn and you learn from everybody at your SEAL team from the techs that are taking care of weapons uh, and your dive gear to um, your own platoon mates, young and old, you know, you can learn something from everybody. So I would say the natural ability is to be flexible be open-minded to suggestions of ways to do things um, and ways to get things done. Uh, not necessarily the easiest way, but maybe the better way or maybe even the safer way. Who knows? You know, all those things come into play. And of course, you know, 
like I said, you need to stay fit as a career in SEALs. And here's the one catch. You know, you're going to be older longer than you are younger in a career of SEALs. If you do 20 plus years, I promise you, after 30, you will definitely feel the wear and tear of maybe eight to 10 years of being, you know, through buds and operational for those first few years. Um, so, you know, being able to maintain your physical uh, performance uh, for your job, uh, be able to have an ability to mitigate stress, um, variety of ways to do that. Um, you know, which is all part of your resilience training that you will receive along your way. Um, but yeah, there's, I would say that's, that's it, you know, just have a good interest in being a team player, wanting to be a part of a team. I think that's probably number one and just, just be malleable and open to learning, learning new things all the time because technology changes. Next thing you know, you're adding technology to your job and you're, doing satellite communications and communicating with drones and uh, other air assets. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool, pretty cool skills that you have to uh, learn along the way and constantly be willing to learn. Um, let's see, is there a job, is there a good job availability for those who choose the SEALs? Um, no. Not really. I mean, it is, it is a tight community. Like I said, you know, earlier, you know, about 75, 80% of the people who try to get a job in the Navy SEALs do not get it. So top 20% typically get those jobs. Um, and there's only 22, maybe 2,300 SEALs in the Navy you know, that are active duty. Not all of those are operational. Many of those are in administrative leadership and training uh, part of their job. Um, so depending on what you're talking about as job availability, it's tight. It's a small community. You know, the big green machine of the army creates a lot more green berets than the Navy creates SEALs. So if you think about maybe, let's see, if you can send how many people we probably graduate a year maybe 250 a year and you might send a thousand to buds typically that's that's not a big community so it's a tight community and it's it's hard to get that job so like i said it's easy to get to the training much harder to get through the training and if you're focused on just passing PSTs, you're not going to get through the training. Like I said, you'll get to the training and probably do that very well, but you're going to have to rely on some other elements of fitness in order to get through the training and a greater amount of that, whether that's endurance, running and swimming and rucking, strength, uh, that's rucking, load bearing, uh, log PT and boats, you know, things like that. So. Plus, you got to be able to learn on a quick learning curve. So that makes it all challenging, and that makes the job availability for those who choose the SEALs equally as challenging. It's just a numbers game, and typically 75% of the people don't make it. So I can't classify that as good job availability. All right, so what would you rate the opportunities for advancement as poor, fair, good, or excellent? Um, good. You know, I've seen a lot of guys make chief really quickly, you know, probably on par or faster as your typical um, uh, Navy uh, enlisted chief, you know, petty officer making chief. Um, advancements are there for those who – can pass the test, um, be a good uh, operator. I will say this, it used to be a lot different whenever the enlisted community, um, whenever they would advance, they had to take a test on a job that they really weren't doing. So if you were a bosun's mate or a gunner's mate, you know, that was also a SEAL, 
you would have to take the test with all the bosun's mates and all the gunner's mates as competition in the entire Navy. So now everybody's an SO, so they compete with each other to make those ranks. So yeah, there, it may be tight. There might be several E6s at a SEAL team all trying to make chief and only a couple of them make it um, because now they're competing with each other for a limited number of chief spots. So it could be an issue. It may not be an issue. Uh, just depends on what side of that line you are on. Um, you know, as with any job in the Navy, advancement happens typically either by time um, or by extraordinary capabilities. You may be faster than your peers. So, um, but I would say good, you know, to excellent in that um, answer. Good question, though. For the officer side, it's typically a time. Um, like every, like ensigns make Lieutenant JG in two years if they don't really screw something up. I've seen people really screw things up. You know, you can not make a, the next rank if you really do something stupid. Um, what does that mean, stupid? Uh, DUIs. Um, uh, you know, accidental discharge of your weapon, you know, little operational things like that, you know, could really screw your, um, screw your chances for making the next rank or just being a poor leader too. And poor fit reps, fit reps, um, getting going into, uh, the next cycle. So, and then four years or five years, you get, uh, make Lieutenant, after that, it's probably nine or 10 years later, or not later, but into your career that you make lieutenant commander, probably 14, 15 years, you're in a commander zone. But once again, it, it's, it's hard to make those. You know, not everybody makes lieutenant commander. Not everybody makes commander. There's a lot of people retire 20 years as lieutenant commander, retire as a commander. They don't make captain. Usually after 20, you make captain. Um, and then it, it really kind of caps out there. Uh, there are only a few admirals in the SEAL teams. Um, that is a, a completely different launch platform to try to make admiral as a uh, SEAL. You have to be really squared away, good leader. <clears throat> and, um, you know, by that time, you probably put in 25, almost 30 years of service. Um, to make that. So it's, it's quite a, an impressive accomplishment to stay in that long. Um, let's see, could you list a particular advantage of being a SEAL, a particular disadvantage? Um, advantage of being a SEAL, it's a great job with even better people. Um, I enjoyed being a SEAL. I enjoy being in a room with people that you could count on no matter what. Um, that were smarter than you, uh, that were stronger than you, more capable of than you, and you know, just being a part of that community for the time that I was was a complete honor. <clears throat> so, I would say the advantage is the community itself, um, being a part of that community. Um, and doing a really cool job. I mean, it's, it is a fun job. I mean, you get to do everything you wanted to as a little kid playing GI Joe. I mean, it, and, even, and more, it's, it's a good job. Uh, disadvantage is obviously you are away from home for a significant amount of time doing your job. Uh, whether you are training in another area of the country or you are, working long hours or you are overseas deployed, um, you are going to be most likely, if you're at an operational unit, away from home longer than you are there. Now, there may be a year that you're home for nine months. There may be a year that you're home for only three to six months. Just depends on how, you know, everything works out, you know, in your journey uh, and what's going on. You know, tip, you're on a typical cycle usually, and you know, as long as that cycle, there's nothing super emergent that occurs during that cycle. You're going to be on a cycle of 
uh, coming back from deployment, which could be six months or a little more doing, um, you know, kind of a stand down for a little bit, probably a month or so of leave. And then you come back and start a workup cycle again, that may take a year, year, eight months or 18 months, and then you deploy again. So during all that time, you're doing training, you're getting your new unit together and doing it, getting ready to do the same thing again. So I would say the disadvantage, you know, for me personally was you're just away from home a lot. And when I was in, it was peacetime. So I was in during the nineties, completely different time than after nine 11, uh, and still gone. I mean, my first year of marriage, I was gone nine months, my year of engage or year and a half of two years of engagement. I was gone nine months. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, what it was like. So still is. Do you have any advice for someone interested in SEALs, such as things to study? Um, good question. I get this one a lot, um, whether that is languages or math or science, um, history, you know, all the above. You should be a good student, you know, or at least find something that you're really interested in school and do really well in it because, you know, being average is no longer part of your journey. If this is something that you want to do in your life, th there's no average Joe getting through that, right? There's something about it. You might not be a particular advanced specimen physically, but there may be something that allows you to endure a great amount of pain and suffering for that, uh, that is training. Uh, there may be some academic skills that you bring to the table, whether that's you know, skills and languages, um, or just being able to think, you know, think under stress. That's a huge one. I think that's a why, why SEAL training is so hard is it tries to find those people who can still think while being stressed and in pain, because that is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be calm, cool, collected while you are tired and exhausted physically beat down um, and still be able to move forward every day. Um, doesn't mean you don't get to rest. I'm just saying that's, you know, obviously when you're doing your job, you're able to do it. And that's the, I think that's what makes them special out of everything. Um, but if you want to study something to get through buds, I would suggest um, maybe taking a scuba course just to see if you're comfortable under the water. Um, definitely do math and science because you need to understand the principles of what occurs to your body when you're diving. Usually the pressure, volume, temperature rules and physics, Boyle's law, Charles law, uh, algebra probably is very important. Definitely as if you can get higher than algebra, that's great. But if you can be really good at algebra, that will help you with some of the dive math that occurs in second phase, as well as just general calculations, you know, for other things too, whenever you're navigating or, um, you know, just doing math and figuring out courses and charts and things like that for navigating on the ocean, as well as navigating on land. Um, you need to have the, that general understanding. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty good. I mean, if you happen to understand some medic stuff, maybe as an EMT during your journey, I think that's a good skill to bring into uh, the teams. Um, languages, eh, it's good to have some language skills, um, even if it's Spanish, you know, or French. French is really big in, in Africa. You will be using French probably in Spanish, you know, in South America. Uh, but yeah, if you can learn Arabic, that's going to be even better. Okay. Are there any current problems faced by most SEALs? Um, not quite sure what that question means. Um, I mean, I think anytime you're at war for 18, 19 years, uh, there's going to be problems that occur. Um, 
usually those problems might not even manifest themselves until uh, it's peacetime and you're doing peacetime deployments instead of operational um, war combat deployments. Um, you know, taking care of a warrior without a war is probably one of the greatest challenges that's out there, no matter what military unit you're in. Um, that's just the way it is. So I would say that would be the biggest problem. But, you know, you're on the front line of battling people who hate us, and we have to do that over there in their world. Um, so you're gone doing a very dangerous job face to face with people that hate you and want you dead. So, um, yes, I would not want to, um, say that was not a problem. You know, that is something that SEALs overcome every day and they have to do that as well as other units and spec ops and conventional forces, of course. Uh, why did you choose to become a SEAL as your profession? Well, you know what? I would, I would not, I would argue with you that it was a profession. I only did it for eight years. So I did it from age 22 to 30. So I can't really call that a profession. I would call it at best, maybe an apprenticeship. Um, but you know, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that job. I wanted to, I knew the people that were there and I loved them. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to go to the Naval Academy where I saw people graduating from there and moving on into the SEAL teams, telling us about their journey and was quite envious of that journey. Then we also had uh, some great enlisted SEALs that were in charge of us, you know, at the Naval Academy. Um, that you really wanted to earn their respect um, by being a better person and learning how to take care of them and make sure that, you know, they're on the right path, you know, with this journey as well, uh, but also learn from them too. So, you know, I, I looked at it as a great opportunity to get better, to learn, uh, to test myself, to see exactly you know, how tough I was. Um, but also, you know, I knew, you know, going into the Naval Academy, I wanted to serve my country when I graduated and I owed the Navy five years. I wound up doing eight or almost eight. Um, and, um, you know, serving your country in any job, I think is a very rewarding experience. I highly recommend it if you're allowed to do that. Um, but doing it as a Navy SEAL, I, I just became a passion, especially once I started meeting them, uh, and getting to know, you know, what type of people actually did that job. And they were just normal people that, um, just like to push themselves and challenge themselves with not just, you know, an easy mission, but the hardest missions that are possible for human beings to endure. Um, and their training prepares you for that type of process. You know, I would say out of everything you learn out of Navy SEAL training is uh, you are actually 10 times stronger than your brain will let it be. And you also learn how to, you know, still be tired and exhausted, beat up, and able to think under pressure. I mean, there have been instances since I've been out where it was a very dangerous situation that had occurred, life or death type situation. And by, I, I swear from my training, I was able to relax, calm everybody down and calm myself down and think of a way out of that situation. Um, and it was nothing horrible. It was just a dangerous situation that Mother Nature um, caused. And, um, but there were some people were starting to panic and, you know, cooler heads prevailed and we were able to 
get out of there with nobody hurt. So, I mean, things like that, little situations like that, um, where you react calmly to a certain situation, whether that is coming up and giving somebody a Heimlich, you know, which you wouldn't think is very tough to do, but it is actually pretty challenging. Um, and just being relaxed about the whole process. Um, you know, so I, I would say there's a lot of things you learn out of that journey um, that just make you a better person in general. Uh, so I have enjoyed, like I said, I only did eight years. I, I call it an apprenticeship, not a profession, but I enjoyed all of them. Um, I, I got out because I started, I got married four years before and about four years in, I was married. And four years later, we started having kids roughly. And um, like I said, it was 1999. I got out in 1999 with a couple of kids. Um, and Or one kid, had another kid two years later. Um, so, you know, it was a personal reason for me. Um, glad I did it. I'm glad I'm able to help people prepare for that. In fact, if you're wondering like what I do, um, I actually write fitness programming for not just SEALs, but for anybody in the tactical world. So military, law enforcement, uh, SWAT teams, uh, firefighters, special ops. Um, that's what stewsmithfitness.com is. It is my website that provides a, you know, products um, and services there in, in that realm. Uh, but I also have a local program here in Maryland called the Heroes of Tomorrow, um, where uh, I train people for free who want to serve. And that service is um, military, law enforcement, firefighters. We get a lot of uh, teenage kids that want to go join the military right out of high school. Uh, some of them are, you know, going conventional, uh, army, Marine Corps. We get some high school kids that want to go to the service academies, you know, army, Navy, air force, coast guard, merchant Marine Academy. So we help those people prepare, but we get a big group of people who want to serve in seals or SWIC, uh, army special forces. I would say those are our three biggest, um, also get some local FBI agents that are in the region that train with us and prepare for their SWAT teams. Um, maybe, you know, a couple of HRT guys. Uh, so it's, it's just fun. Um, and they're free workouts that, um, I invite people to come join us if they want to serve. That's the big connection. If you're preparing to serve, you can join our workouts, um, in Maryland. Here's a tomorrow. In fact, if you go to stewsmith.com and click the free workouts link at the top, you will see um, you'll see our schedule where we train, what we train. We swim five, six days a week, run, lift, PT, and we go in a periodization cycle that I've been doing for over 20 years now where uh, we, we lift during the winter. Uh, we do a calisthenics running program during the spring and summer, we really peak it up to really high levels of high rep calisthenics and high mileage and swimming in the summer. And then we start tapering the running back down in the fall where we uh, start introducing weights again, you know, and start decreasing the running, but we still swim and get some extra cardio in there with rucking and things like that. So we just transition through the year and focusing on different elements of fitness that tend to work well together. So for instance, you know, strength and power, speed and agility all work well together. If you've ever done football preseason training, those are the four big things you're working on. You know, if you're more of an endurance guy, endurance and muscle stamina work real well together. It's hard to get really good at strength while at the same time trying to get a faster four mile timed run, right? It's, it's just, Improving your endurance and your strength at the same time is difficult. Maintaining one while you improve the other is very possible. Um, but that's why we kind of break it up a little bit. Um, and then once you're good at everything, maintaining them through the year, it, it's very possible to, to do that and work hard, but also recover hard. <laughs> you're not going to, 
you're not going to get stronger if you don't recover and get good night's sleep. So, and eat well. So there's a whole lot to tactical fitness. I'll put some links in the, uh, in the description below um, concerning some of these answers, as well as, you know, to give some follow on information, as well as some of the stuff I just spoke about here at the end. But that is what I do. Um, this one just happened to be a series of questions coming from a student doing a project. Thought I would help them out with a video answer process, as well as um, uh, so a written one as well. So I'll make an article of this, and uh, it will be um, in the description below as well. So, hey, thanks for listening. Hope you picked up something on this one. And uh, feel free to email me, stu at stusmith.com, if you have questions or leave a comment in the comment section of this video. And have a good day. We'll see you later.